natural history. So this is something heroic, and, and as you see, uh, adult, adult deformity especially is, is, is as difficult as this. It's not as difficult. Uh, so, so consider, I can do it. I cannot, I cannot outrun a cheetah. But then again, it's, it's, it's fairly <coughs> difficult, I should say. Why is it different? Uh, we're a very heter heterogeneous population. Uh, we are all adults, so if we have deformity, uh, then we're going to be categorized as adult deformity. Our parents have are adults as well. So if they, have, if they have deformities, they're going to be categorized. And I'm assuming that at least for some of us, our grandparents are alive and they're adults as well. So if they have deformity, their deformity is going to be classified as adult deformity as well. So it is a huge range and it can be ascending scoliosis, a, a, the artifact of a descending scoliosis or a de, de novo uh, descending uh, scoliosis as well. About what is an important consideration here is that adults, especially as they age, uh, do not uh, do do not consider cosmesis as a very important factor uh, in their lives. Whereas function becomes much more important. If you ask a 13-year-old girl, she would rather look good uh, than be able to walk 100 meters. Or on the contrary, if you ask a 80-year-old woman, uh, she would accept looking terrible so as to be able to walk 100 meters. So uh, their perceptions of their deformity, perceptions of the problem are actually very, 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 very different. So this is one adult deformity. This is a manual worker, 38-year-old uh, male. As you can see, he is deformed. He has uh, scoliosis, as you can see here. He has kyphosis here in his lumbar spine, uh, a, 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 an area that should have been lordotic. And this uh, lady, 72 years of age, uh, is actually, this is adult deformity as well. As you can see, there is scoliosis. And as you can see, he is probably 15, 15 to 20 centimeters forward. So she, she is like this. Uh, I can tell you, she can only walk 50 meters. And if we do not treat this lady, this deformity uh, is not the only problem here. She has spinal stenosis as well. If we do not treat this lady, she's probably not going to be able to use the toilet in her house in, uh, in some, some years. It may be three years, it may be five years, but it eventually happens. So this is like adolescent idiopathic scoliosis was cosmetic surgery. Here, now we're not doing cosmetic surgery. This is essential surgery for the elderly. Uh, population. We did not rec recognize this 20 years ago because our elderly population was very small, especially in Turkey, we had a very small uh, elderly population. But now as our population ages, as your population ages, this becomes a, a real uh, problem. And interestingly, uh, I am a part of a study group that's called European Spine Study Group. So this is uh, like a piggyback, we, we just uh, put all our adult deformity cases in, in this bag and then uh, just evaluate uh, these. So this is something done on 400 adolescent idiopathic scoliosis cases. These are, these are uh, the tests for function. Uh, you may or may not know them, but this, these are the objective criteria to test whether uh, a patient is functional uh, or not. And uh, as you can see here, Lumbar lordosis, or these are called sagittal balance parameters, uh, are, have very high correlation uh, with the function of the patient. So as the patient, as we age, as we fall forward, we are actually losing function. And we should not, by definition, let these patients fall further forward. So if the patient is balanced, if they are balanced, they can tolerate up to 50, 60 degrees of uh, scoliosis, but once, they actually fall forward more than five centimeters. They tend to they tend to just succumb and uh, fall fall forward every year more and more. This is what we want to uh, <coughs> correct. I'll just show you a couple of cases uh, about what uh, can be done. This is a 67-year-old uh, lady, uh, fairly osteoporotic, 
uh, fairly good posture about spinal uh, stenosis. Uh, this is what we have done. Now, this is at two years. This is, as you can see, a more severe deformity. This is a lady, uh, very similar to the lady uh, that uh, we were uh, seeing. And this is what we had done, early postoperative, uh, one year uh, follow-up. And this is a 61-year-old lady with osteoporotic fractures. This was done at St. Saint Saint Elsewhere Hospital. Uh, as you can see, uh, kyphoplasty, kyphoplasty, uh, percutaneous uh, fixation, uh, but she is still falling uh, forward. So this is what we've done uh, to this lady. As, as you see, as the deformity gets more and more serious, I don't know whether you're noticing this, but uh, the surgery is getting more and more ser serious as well. If you just look at the uh, rods and the uh, screws, it's, it's, they're, they're the same rods and the screws. But I can tell you here uh, that, uh, as you can see, this is, this is a cage here, this is a cage here, and we did not do anterior surgery for this lady. So, so this is a two-level posterior osteotomy. Now this 78 year old uh, lady uh, was in surgery for uh, about probably eight hours or so and she bled about 3,000 3, cc's, three liters uh, of uh, blood blood. So uh, there is no limit to their functional incapacities. Uh, they can be functionally very limited, but they can be very difficult uh, to treat as well. So, uh, as I'm telling you that we have to treat these patients, I'm not telling you that it is, it is easy. It, it requires fairly uh, high technology uh, hospitals, fairly highly knowledgeable uh, support personnel, and, and fairly accustomed uh, surgeons as well. So this is, this is why I've shown you uh, the, the, the cheetah. Okay, so this is, this is uh, before and this is after uh, two, two years, but uh, this, this took, uh, as I said, uh, three liters of blood loss and an eight, uh, eight hour, uh, eight hour uh, operation. In summary, adult spinal deformity is not similar to pediatric deformity. Uh, restoration of function is the ultimate goal, and uh, by function, we have to understand, it's easier to understand sagittal balance these patients lose their function when they lose their sagittal balance and restoration of the sagittal balance takes longer instrumentations and often uh, spinal osteotomies. I'll just show you three slides of TV spondylitis because it's, it's probably something that you see. Uh, we do do surgery uh, on TV uh, spondylitis in Turkey. It's fairly common uh, in Turkey as well. It was more common 20 years ago than it tended to disappear about 10 years ago. Now we're seeing, we're starting to see more and more patients uh, again in the, in the, in the last uh, three, three to five years. The indications for surgery are neurological involvements, deformity or impending deformity, and presence of large abscess. Uh, the first one is fairly understandable. Uh, the second one, impending deformity means, there is a very simple rule to this. If you have uh, the destruction of one complete vertebral body, it comes to you as 30 degrees of kyphosis. So if you've lost two vertebral bodies, it comes to you as 60 degrees of kyphosis. Three comes to you as 90 degrees of kyphosis. So we do not wait for them to develop 90 degrees of kyphosis before operating on them. When we look at their MRIs, when we look at their x-rays, if we see the destruction of one to two to three complete vertebral bodies, then we tend to operate on them earlier. Uh, because it's easier to operate on them earlier, it's easier to correct their deformities if you detect the deformity before uh, the deformity actually <coughs> happens. And then thirdly, uh, the presence of a large abscess or necrotic tissue, we have a series of over 100 patients that I have compiled when I was a resident. Uh, of these, 54 had large abscesses. Of these, 16 have drained by themselves. So they develop fistulas. So uh, those large abscesses actually are, are not amenable for treatments uh, with chemotherapy only. You have to drain them. You, ha you can drain them with open surgery. You can drain them uh, with percutaneous surgery. It's up to you. It's up to uh, what is available uh, in your center. But you have to drain them. So uh, two cases. This is a 
uh, thoracic one, fairly familiar, as you can see, abscess on uh, both sides, uh, some, some abscess on the uh, epidural space as well. Uh, the gold standard for treatment for us now, and I have, uh, oh, I am in the team uh, with a fairly large number of publications on this. Uh, if there is destruction of bone or, or if there is abscess in the anterior column, we tend to <coughs> treat them in the anterior column. So uh, our gold standard now is anterior instrumentation and fusion. You can use anterior instrumentation, you can use anterior bone, you can use anterior cages, you can use whatever you want anteriorly, but it is <coughs> anterior instrumentation. And this is another case, again, as you see, this, this patient uh, we saw uh, with uh, paralysis, huge abscess on one side. And as you can see, anterior uh, instrumentation and with an, with an anterior uh, cage as well. So in summary, uh, deformity surgery is one of the last frontiers uh, in spinal surgery. Uh, we are all successful, but it depends on good patient selection, good planning, uh, having adequate resources. This is mandatory. You have to, you have to know what you're going to do. You have to be sure that you have those resources uh, to do this. Uh, knowing the spectrum of possibilities and being aware of your uh, abilities and shortcomings. I can do this, I cannot do this. There are things that I cannot do, there are things that I can do. So I do not do the things that I can do. Uh, and it does not depend on the type of instrumentation. So do not think in terms of what instrumentation I use, what instrumentation I have, what instrumentation I do not have. It's, it's, it's based on basically your abilities, not, not the instrumentation. The instrumentation does not correct the <laughs> You're going to be the one to correct the deformity. Thank you.